possible that they look better because a lot more effort has been put into that. But if we invested an equal amount of effort for the other proxy classes, maybe we'd see something different. Anyway, speaking of proxies, I wanted to give you a, a brief perspective on what actually we are uh, putting into that big uh, cauldron that we call LMR. Um, so this is a big collaborative effort. Um, And I've been told not to use the pointer, by the way, for the other um, speakers, because the talks are recorded, and so we should be using the mouse. You can see the mouse. Okay. All right, so mostly I put together this presentation with some input from Caleb, who did a lot of the initial data wrangling, um, and as well as other members of the LMR team. Um, we'll see a lot from Pages 2K, where I couldn't acknowledge all of my 97 co-authors there, but uh, they're, they're there in spirit. Um, and then. I'll talk a little bit about what Linkers has done, um, so uh, acknowledging that team as well. So I'll go into LMR database and specifically Pages 2K because as you saw, that's the centerpiece for the release candidate. Uh, and then I'll talk a little bit because that's a question we often get for the, the proxy folks in the room. They often have that question of how do I get my data into LMR? How do I contribute to uh, that pipeline? Uh, and that's very much something that we've I want to give you a perspective on that. All right. If this actually moves. All right. So this is the, the LMR framework, as you've seen it. And of course, the data are right there on the right-hand side. So what goes into um, this system? So there's basically, and this is pretty much the most important thing in this talk, there's three sources of data that we've looked at. The first one, pages 2K, we'll hear about a lot more. Then there's a subset of the International Tree Ring Data Bank, the ITRDB, that was kind of cleaned up and uniformly processed by Peta, Petra Britten-Moser. Um, and so that's the so-called Britten-Moser data set. And then there's a bunch of work that Caleb did in sort of uh, looking through the dark corners of the National Climatic Data Center and exploring every drawer and like finding records under the carpet. Um, and so we'll be talking about that. That's the one that has the least uh, vetting, uh, and that probably needs more vetting from the community. Uh, and so you know, that's one uh, thing that we haven't fu uh, fully explored, um, but there's some potential there. And so all of three of these things potentially can feed into LMR. Uh, so that's something that the hackathon participants uh, will be able to play with. Uh, there's different options in the code um, where you can say um, that you want one of these three or all three of them. Um, so if you're interested in exploring those aspects, actually, you know, that's one of the benefits of having the LMR code is you can do it yourself and then tell us what you found. All right, so for Pages 2K, as you know, this is a highly collaborative endeavor, uh, mostly wrangled by Lucien von Gunten, who's right there, uh, who kept us all on in line for a, a few years. Um, so, you know, about 100 co-authors participated in this effort. Uh, we gathered uh, roughly 700 records from 650 locations around the globe. There's a very wide diversity of proxies. Of course, quite a bit of tree rings, which um, make up the majority, um, you know, more than 60% of the database in recent times, but they peter out fairly early, as you know. And then there's some more low resolution, but uh, longer term proxies that are left in database. So in the first millennium, we have really in about an equal proportions between tree rings, marine sediments, lake sediments, and ice cores. Uh, and of course, uh, a lot of corals, uh, about uh, 96 of them, uh, which unfortunately, except for Palmyra, uh, peter out you know, before the 1600s or so. So what can I tell you about this that you already know? Uh, the resolution varies quite a bit, so most of the corals have monthly resolution, or at least sub-annual. Um, the majority of the proxies have at least annual resolution, which is for the trees. Uh, but then, of course, for some of the marine sediment cores, sometimes you have up to decadal resolution. Now, that's not something that LMR at present is able to handle. Uh, at least we haven't been willing to take that leap. I mean, mathematically, you could do it, but it's a bit risky. So right now, in all of the the way the code is set up, we only take the annual resolution proxy, annually resolved proxy. But in pr uh, Greg alluded to the fact that, in principle, we could be also blending in these different multi-resolution proxies. And that's definitely a new frontier for trying to say, 
it's constrained. Let's use the high resolution proxy to constrain the high frequencies and the low resolution proxy to constrain low frequencies. But there's, of course, a lot of uh, uh, calibration or at least proxy system modeling that needs to take place to do that properly with the low value. But that's definitely where we're going. So for pages 2K, uh, one thing that really is important to mention is that you know there was a big push from, um, so this was done by many experts around the globe who contributed the records they knew about the most. So Eric, for example, was part of the Antarctic Consortium, and we asked the people, send us your latest and best data from, from each region uh, that you think represents temperature. And that was a, a key part about this. Now, LMR is interpretation agnostic in a way. So um, this was done very much more in mind with traditional climate reconstruction efforts, or even people who just want to do composites, like I will do shamelessly in a few slides. Um, so I want to point out that for future syntheses, and particularly in the context of pages, or you know, when we see things like ISO 2K, which Bronwyn will talk about, the interpretation actually for data simulation isn't quite as, as critical as it was before. But there is still a really important element of quality control in these things, where you at least, at least had experts who discussed these various records. Um, um, one thing that at least qualitatively is important is I think to be able to say whether uh, each of these things responds positively or negatively to temperature let's say, or precipitation. So even if you don't have a quantitative handle of what's the fraction of the variance that's accounted for by a particular variable, at least having a basic quality check of you know do we expect this thing to increase or decrease when climate warms, that's pretty important. So pages put a lot of effort into really curating that. Um, so we're not at the moment using all of that metadata as we could be. And so that's, again, another area of growth potentially. If you want to compare this to previous efforts, um, so the, the last big paleo reconstruction effort was, of course, what Mike Mann had done in 2008 and 2009. And that was really overwhelmingly dominated by tree rings. There were a lot of tree rings. And I think a lot of people in the tree community were a bit skeptical uh, because this was ostensibly only a temperature reconstruction. A lot of the tree rings in there were not, in the, in the least, the pure temperature recorders. Um, so going from Manuel Manu 2008 to the initial uh, release of Pages 2K, which was in 2013, there was actually quite a bit of a downside from you know 1,100 proxies or so to a half of that. So you can say that page 2K was a lot more stringent about the selection criteria, uh, but still quite a, quite a few trees. Um, uh, we have also much expanded coverage over the poles, so it's now looking, you know, the Arctic 2K is fairly uh, multi-proxy in the sense that there's an opportunity to do what you were suggesting and sort of if you remove one tree or um, you know, if you want to compare the signals between different proxy archives that are located nearby, you can do that over places like the Arctic, which are relatively dense. Uh, over Antarctic, in some regions, you actually have paired measurements where we haven't actually pushed it as far as we could. But I think there's opportunities there for, for these kind of selective validation exercises. And then there's vast swath of the world where you don't have that luxury. So, you know, we'll have to wait until we, until Santa delivers us a lot more proxies from the southern hemisphere. So this was nominally a, an exercise in reconstructing temperature. So we did some extensive validation um, against instrumental temperature. Um, my favorite way of looking at this is if you take, for example, hat crew four, and you take all the grid boxes, and you ask how many of these grid boxes are within a certain radius of a proxy with um, you know, a significant correlation. Uh, and it comes out to about two thirds of the globe is covered uh, on, under those conditions. So there's a pretty good coverage. Of course, as you go back towards the first millennium, that coverage decreases. But at least over the most recent period, uh, this database is unique in, in sampling as much of the temperature grid as has been done before. And yeah, despite these. Um, there's pros and cons definitely to uh, re comparisons over against any instrumental product. I think you know you saw Greg uh, show you these comparisons. The way we've approached it in LMR is just do it with a big suite of different instrumental products, and you definitely see quite a bit of variability. Uh, in this case.
case we have uh, we've only done it with have crew four, which has some pros and cons. Um, but under those conditions, only about 50% of the proxy temp series were significantly correlated uh, over the instrument. Relatively, but that's also because we had to exclude, of course, a lot of low resolution proxies for which you couldn't do directly. Okay, so then the next thing we did was to make composites. Uh, and we were, to our surprise, we found an amazing uh, element of robustness. So these are just six different ways of doing it um, with various amounts of screening. So one of the things that we did is, um, you know, the difference between these blue curves and these gray curves. The gray ones correspond to high resolution proxies, so anything high, more high resolution than five years, and the low res are you know five years and longer. Uh, and we were pretty stunned to see how much uh, agreement there is. Uh, so we may, we bid them in either 25 years, 50 years, or 100 years, um, and there's also different amounts of screening that took place, whether you only want you want to look at all the proxies or the ones that have some uh, regionally, statistically significant association with temperature within, let's say, a radius of 2,000 kilometers, or whether you want to be more stringent than that. But basically, we always get, except for this particular case where there's really almost no proxies left, um, there's, there's pretty uh, surprising agreement, at least surprising because if you've ever played with proxies you know that it's hard to get them to agree about anything um, and so the result of that is if you put everything into one pot and in that case you do some 30 year averages you do get a very nice hockey stick um, so as Greg said you know there's not much mystery of what happens at the global scale uh, perhaps you know the the people who really love the medieval climate anomaly will have to find solace somewhere else that uh, we do well. We do see a relatively warm MCA compared to the Little Ice Age, but really not compared to the rest of you know, the early millennium. And you know, it could be that we're missing something fundamental, or it could be that there really wasn't anything that special about the medieval climate anomaly, at least globally. I don't deny that some places in Europe it might have been um, important, but there's not much evidence for in this database. Okay, so what does this look like in? Um, LMR, I'll get to that in a minute. Another thing that, we, another game that we played was to explore the robustness of these composites uh, compared to different kinds of screening from uh, relatively coarse. Uh, so here in that case, you're left with 400 records. Um, screening where you did some fancy stats and then you're down to 262 or even more stringent when you restricted yourself to only those proxies that had significant correlation to the closest temperature grid point with the caveat that sometimes when you're in Antarctica, the closest temperature grid point can be <laughs> many thousand miles away. So, um, But regardless of how you look at it, you get a hockey stick. Um, and you do get hockey sticks in any other number of ways. So another thing we looked at was the effect, effective record length. Um, so you know, do you, for example, restricting yourself to proxies that go back to 1750 or 1500, thousand CE or even the very beginning of the common era and so the shape varies a little bit and the uncertainties of course widen when you have fewer proxies I think you'd all agree to be that there's some pretty amazing robustness in, in the shape of, of these composites and the same thing happens when you look archive by archive um, with a few differences of course so you know marine sediments don't really because of their resolution don't really fully resolve the, the recent uptick in temperature, which you see, of course, in, um, in all of the other ones, in particular corals. There's um, the documentary records look a little bit funky at the end, too. Uh, I don't have great um, insight in that. But at least for, for all of the other ones that have a fair amount of records, let's say 30 or more, um, again, hockey sticks galore. So, you know, that led us to believe that there was maybe something robust about this. And, um, and now we feel comfortable touring that at some more fancy methods, like LMR. So this was a figure that Michael made. I believe this was only using, again, the, the pages 2K data. Uh, and this was uh, Northern Hemisphere temperature reconstruction in red and the Southern Hemisphere reconstruction in purple. Um, the purple one is a lot more muted. It could be at this point, we don't really know the answer to that, I believe, because we don't have enough data from the southern hemisphere, or it could be because it's you know mostly ocean and that there's 
not the interannual variations are not as great in the layer. And I don't think we have a very good handle on that. Uh, you do see, and I will come back to this tomorrow, uh, a lot of um, downward excursions, which will turn out to be uh, timed exactly with the Siegel et al. volcanic eruption. So the proxy will do take that up in a, in a very big way. Um, and LMR fits within a continuum, although perhaps actually more on the conservative end, it's this very light blue curve. You, you can tell Rafi to change that, curve, that color, by the way, because <laughs> it's practically impossible. But this is... Um, a figure that Rafi Neukam made um, and that we're showing with his agreement where you know this was essentially throwing the pages 2k page 2 data at a bunch of uh, temperature reconstruction methods uh, some of which extremely simple like composite plus scales and uh, some of them using Bayesian hierarchical methods all the way to LMR which is actually the only climate field reconstruction of the bunch um, and there's some difference in the centennial scale, but at least all the bumps happen really in line between all of these, and they are largely compatible with the CMIP5 ensemble, which is what's plotted in red. So again, there's some um, some calls for hope. All right, so if you want to venture beyond, as Nathan was alluding to, uh, there's another source of data that we have, uh, which is an extraction of the International Turing Database only of raw Tree-ring width measurements, so no density measurements. And that was done ostensibly because they wanted to do some forward modeling of this thing. Uh, so there's 200, 287 ones. And one of the things that's both, you know, I think uh, a pro and a con, depending on how you look at it, is that they did some uniform detrending or standardization, as it's called in the business, uh, of these trees, so removing the growth trend. And it turns out tree-ring detrending is, you know, very much the secret sauce of the dark art of, uh, of dendroclimatology. And it's often done on a, it's of often highly purpose dependent. So if you're trying to do a moisture reconstruction, you're going to do some kind of detrending, but maybe if you're trying to do a temperature reconstruction, you might do a different detrending. So they did something that I think is defensible in the sense that they didn't have, they wanted to do, uh, to apply uniform detrending to all of the trees in the data set. Um, and so there's some, there's something nice about that, that they're all treated the same way. On the other hand, depending on what you want to do, this is probably not optimal everywhere. But that's, you know, so you, you need to be aware of that if you're going to be using that as part of LMR. Um, and also, as Robert alluded to, if you throw that in, into LMR, some strange things may happen, some series may, may behave weirdly. So, um, con cuidado, as we say. Uh, Michael will show you results uh, later to this morning uh, that make, that uses this data set for drought reconstruction. And, and it ostensibly here, the idea is if you're not just trying to reconstruct temperature, that you should go beyond pages 2K. Because pages 2K, if you believe the experts, was meant to capture only temperature. Uh, I don't believe that there's anything like, uh, such as a pure temperature proxy, but for the most part, it was really targeting temperature. So if you're interested in moisture reconstructions, you should be using a wider data set. But you know, this points to the fact that there's probably some untapped resources in ITRDB from the MXD, from the you know, mixed lake with density that can, could be used. So I think there's still some, some prospect for future data synthesis of that kind. All right, so this is a comparison that Kevin Enchukaitis made uh, very recently and that he showed, for those of you who were at CMIP last week. And I think that's pretty remarkable. So this is comparing the N-trend data set, which is uh, a very simple treat statistical treatment of 58 ring width and uh, mixed lake width density series, only from the northern hemisphere. And there was there was a northern hemisphere temperature reconstruction, just a temperature index by Wilson et al. And then uh, earlier this year, Kevin published a field reconstruction for the northern hemisphere. And he's plotted um, that that entrant reconstruction here for the northern hemisphere temperature in red. And it's ostensibly, uh, you know, these are trees. They only grow during summer. So this is targeting summer temperatures, May, June, July, August. Nominally, when we were doing uh, pages 2K annual PSMs, we were targeting the annual mean. So there's quite a bit of difference. If you rescale LMR to only the uh, May, June, July, August, then it's pretty hard to tell the difference between the two curves. I mean, there's some noise. But what I find remarkable is that we're using 
completely different methodology. Run it is just basically a very simple plain Jane multiple linear regression that an end ran with 58 theories. The other one uses you know, an order of magnitude more theories from all over the world, uses climate models, Kalman filter, and still you get very, very similar uh, variability, you get very, very similar low frequency variability, and of course the timing of some of the excursions lines up exactly, and that's the timing of volcanic eruptions. So I think this is a time to you know take stock of that, because for a long time we were making temperature reconstructions and publishing them, and then that just contributed to a big spaghetti diagram in IPCC reports, and no two reconstructions looked alike, even though they tried. And now we're not even trying, and we get reconstructions that really look pretty similar. So I think it's saying that we've come to a point where there's enough information in the proxies that no matter what you do to them, you're going to get a common signal. And to me, that's very good news. And it means that as we go forward, we should see more and more agreement. We've sort of passed that point where we see disagreements everywhere, or at least for the northern hemisphere. I think for the southern hemisphere, we'll still be in the disagreement phase for quite a bit until we reach, reach a critical mass of proxies. perhaps celebrate that in a few years. So finally, the end, uh, the, the last part, which is the least um, vetted part of it, is, is what Caleb did. And I believe he was after, um, tell me if I, if I got this wrong, Caleb, but it was after records that had a resolution finer than 25 years, that were longer than 40 years, and this was important for LMR, they needed to have established proxy system models. What you mean by established? Debatable in the case of speleothems, I think there they would be you know, quite a few people to duke it out over what what the established one. But at least there there needs to be some published PSMs to go with that. So it's only ice cores, coral speleothems, and lake cores. I'm not sure what PSM you were thinking about. Right. Okay. Yeah. So var sediment. Uh, so overall, I think how many were there for that? I think only about 250. There's a fair amount, as it turns out, when we when we started looking at the overlap between these different databases, there was a fair amount of overlap. So Robert uh, did, did some very careful sleuthing to uh, make sure that we weren't double dipping. And, those, and so if you if you throw all of these three different data sets at LMR, uh, there's some something happening behind the scenes where you weed out the, the duplicates. In some cases, the duplicates were exact. In some cases, they weren't quite. So there was a bit of guessing. That you have two records that have you know, correlation higher than 0 0.9 something, 0 0.96. I can't remember what the threshold was. Then they're probably duplicates, but we're not exactly sure. Anyway, um, again, if we want to dive more into this, there's probably more that could be done with this. Uh, but this has not received the same community vetting that ABCK has. So if you want to use it, use it at your own risk. And so, yeah, this was this was the total last time. Um, so potentially we have something like uh, over 3,000 records, but there's also a couple of few hundred duplicates in there. Um, okay, so now let me talk a few minutes uh, while I have a captive audience uh, before the coffee break. I want to talk a little bit about the operational pipeline and how hopefully in a not too distant future, you'll be able to very easily throw your data into the LMR workflow. So the idea is that there's various ways that people contribute data uh, to endeavors such like these. So of course, there's these big uh, page, pages style syntheses, like pages 2K or ISO 2K, which Ron Run will tell you about this afternoon. Uh, I'm more interested in if you are somebody who generates data and want to figure out how you can directly contribute to LMR without necessarily going through such a pipeline. Would there be a pathway to do that? And to me, the most immediate pathway is to lipid, the linked paleo data format, which is um, a container for paleo data that Nick Mackey and myself have developed in the past few years. It has a bunch of utilities in major programming languages that allow you to quickly visualize it and process it. And also now increasingly there are links to big data repositories like NOAA Paleo, with whom we have a partnership, uh, uh, Linked Earth is kind of the associated project with that. Uh, and we're also working on getting Pangea to adopt Lipid as a valid submission format. Um, I should say that this is just a file format. I'm not going to bore you with the details. Uh, it's, you can think of it as like NetCDF for Paleo. Basically, 
a standard file format that you could store your data in. Now, that doesn't make it a data standard. To make it a data standard, you need people to agree on what you call things and how you report things. And there's a separate community effort going on with that. But I think the path is pretty clear to, in the next couple of years, have something where we both have a standard format and a standard way of reporting things so that codes like LML or, or you know, major synthesis efforts will be able to very quickly inhale this data set. So I think it will shorten that, that inference spiral quite a bit from where things has been with pages, where it takes you know, about 100 people for six or seven years to gather all these data and you know, really um, micromanage the metadata, I think hopefully we'll get to a stage where that, that cycle will be dramatically compressed and that we can easily get uh, contribute to these things. Uh, there's now some great web. Um, uh, so this is an example of what we call the lipidifier which is a, a web application. Is it still working? Oh, okay. It wasn't starting. There's a video there, but it was freezing, so I'm going to pass. We're working on friendly ways for you to put your data into Lipid. So if you're interested in that, talk to me. So to make a long story short, the data in LMR comes from three sources. The main one is pages 2K, page 2, but there's these other two that you need to be aware of, especially if you're going to be running the code. Uh, there are strengths and weaknesses to LMR, uh, so we don't need really a climate interpretation. However, it could be useful to cross-check that our calibrations are not doing anything crazy, and right now we're not doing a whole lot about it, and that's uh, one area where we could grow. Um, a very exciting development, which was alluded to before, is that now that they are uh, things like the ILME, so now that they are last millennium simulations that have isotopes, we don't have to calibrate delta 18 of ice against temperature, we can just directly assimilate those things. So more on that this afternoon. Uh, and we're, as I said, currently limited to annual resolution, but we're trying to generalize that to longer parts. And what I think is very um, exciting about accelerating that pipeline uh, where the data could find its way uh, within a major reanalysis within a few months or you know less than a year is that one, one of the other benefits of the assimilation frameworks we have is that it is sequential. So let's say you have an existing version of LMR that you, know, you could envision in a future ways. You don't have to rerun the whole thing from the beginning when you add more observations. So you, you could make them, you know, we could potentially make updates a bit more regularly, uh, just you know, in a similar way that operational reanalysis works. Um, so you know, if you think about the last big climate field reconstruction effort, Man and Al 2008, that was almost a decade ago. Hopefully, we won't have to wait a decade for you know, major syntheses to update these climate field reconstruction.